to Gay Time TV and sadly tonight is the last show in the series. Uh, but wipe away those tears because we've saved the best till last. Get a load of this. On tonight's show, we spend an evening with gay professionals who are looking for love. We say our final goodbyes to Beth Jordash. We find out who did it at a gay murder mystery weekend and get some more fitness tips from Mark Anthony and his body beautiful. So stay with it. Later on, I'll be talking to Boy George. And Eve Gallagher will be closing the show with the final Torch song of the series. But before all that, it's time to check out this week's gay stories in our Gay Time TV weekly roundup. First, we have another Gay Time TV video exclusive. This week sees the launch of Madonna, Innocence Lost, which uh, charts the early years of the world's second most famous virgin. And in this scene, Madonna discovers the secret to her success. I take what I need and I move on. And if people can't move with me, well then I'm sorry. How can you be so cold? You must be Madonna. Cracking stuff there. Um, now then, do you remember the good old days when you could tell if someone was gay just because they wore a leather cap, 501s and a check shirt? And that was just the lesbians. Well, hey, well now you can give off that all-important signal by simply revealing your socks. Look at those, they're fantastic. Uh, they cost only three pounds and they're certainly much less embarrassing than a big bushy moustache. Well, uh, a few weeks ago we brought you the incredible gay shower curtain and this week we move into the bedroom with the fantastic lesbian pillowcases. There we go. Let's have a look at those then. This is my one. Oh, Rona, I, I think there's, there's some mistake. There surely. is no mistake. No, that's right. You've guessed. They're Butch and Femme, and they cost £9.50 per pair, and they're available at Screaming in Manchester. Excellent stuff. Buttock news. If you fancy firm buttocks for the rest of your life, then I've got just a book for you. Imaginatively called Buttocks of Steel, my favourite section is entitled Eat Your Way to Healthy Firm Buttocks. There's also handy tips on how to tone whilst watching the telly, so uh, everyone at home, why don't you join in and you too, uh, Rona. Do you think you're Mark Anthony or something? Uh, yes, except I haven't got a strange Welsh accent, but here we go. And we're going to start with our right buttock, so clench and relax. Clench and relax and relax and shake it out. Lovely. And the book is available in the UK and costs £9.95. Excellent. Well, uh, for many of us, the big news the past week has been the death of the nation's favourite lesbian, Brookside's Beth Jordash. As an attractive young lesbian in a primetime show, she changed the public's perception of what a lesbian is and looks like. But how true to life was Beth Jordash and how convincing was Anna Friel's portrayal? This is the grisly scene where the nation discovered that Beth Jordash, Brookside's lesbian heroine, victim of domestic violence and accomplice to murder, was dead. No! I just found out that Beth was dead. I was like, Beth's dead. It's just really... I don't, I don't think it's sunk in yet. It's very strange. I'm very sad that Beth was dead because, uh, A, well, I fancied her. And the other reason was that um, she was a person that I could identify with. It was inevitable, I suppose. It comes to us all, but really, it was a very s stupid way to wrap up their little lesbian subplot, really. Just couldn't handle it anymore. Eh? So, if you were a fella, you would fancy me? Yeah, I think so. But because you're a woman, you don't? I suppose not. Well, that's pretty not far then, isn't it? Oh, well, you might not like me if I was. Yeah, but at least we'd know where to go from here. The challenge in Anna Friel's representation of Beth is that you can't locate Beth in a stereotype. She isn't a bar dyke. She isn't a bike dyke. She isn't this kind of dyke or that kind of dyke. She is a woman. And the, the clever thing is that her desire for women is located where it belongs, in her desire, rather than in some stereotypical setup around style. It was when Beth kissed her best friend Margaret that she came to national prominence and became a lesbian heroine. Yeah. Looks as if they meant it. I mean, every everyone that I knew, every lesbian in South London was on the phone to each other, going, "They're gonna kiss. They're gonna kiss." I remember being in university, and the whole halls went quiet. They, 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 they knew that it was going to be on, and um, when the first kiss happened, they were all like cheering and everything, and it felt it felt really special. 
can always get the last bus home if that's what you really want. But it was only when Beth fell in love with her lecturer, Chris, that she got more confident about her sexuality. I'll stay if that's right with you. By the time uh, Chris and Beth have got together, here's Beth falling in love with a mature woman, and their kiss is really altogether different. It's in this kind of lovely, womb-like, dark, cosy, you don't have to get up, you don't have to go home kind of environment. And th the kiss itself is shot wonderfully because you can see everything. And it's a very busy, confident, active, moving around the mouth kiss. Uh, I think she, uh, Anna was pretty convincing, yeah. Seeing that she's not actually a lesbian and she was playing someone who was only just discovering that she was a lesbian and she was a bit inept, which is a bit appropriate, really. I hate you! But the exploration of her sexuality was played out against the shockingly graphic violence of her domestic life. Beth and her mother Mandy were driven to murder Beth's abusive father Trevor and the resulting trial took on national political significance. It also echoed real life events like the appeal hearings of Sarah Thornton and Emma Humphreys, both women convicted of killing abusive partners. But was the timing more than a coincidence? We know from Brookside that they did schedule the Mandy Jordash appeal to coincide with that of Emma Humphreys. We advised Brookside for many months, building up to the trial and the appeal, on what should happen on the procedure, on how battered women who kill would respond and how their characters would form. Only last week, Sarah Thornton was released on bail from Holloway Prison. But happy endings in life are not always mirrored in fiction. The nation mourns the death of its lesbian icon. I don't know that the death of Beth is the most important news for lesbians, but the life of Beth and millions of people enjoying her lesbianism and indeed for millions of people Beth becoming a heroine. That's probably been one of the most significant bits of lesbian history in recent times. Now it's time for our special guest. He's a living legend. He is Boy George. All right, love. Hello. <laughs> Very pleased to meet you. Thanks. Welcome to the show. Um, I've just been reading your book, which uh, I really enjoyed. And I tell you, the big thing that struck me about it was um, was the violence in it, actually, because it's like every other page you seem to be having a punch up or throwing a bottle at someone or, or giving John Moss a good solid kick in. I, I mean, would you describe yourself as, as, a, as a violent person? I think I've got a violent side. I mean, I grew up in a family that was lots of shouting and screaming, and um, I think it does rub off eventually. I think these days, though, I'm a lot more relaxed. I mean, I used to sort of, like, live on drama, day in, day out. Now I'm a bit more laid back, and I don't really like fighting. I really did enjoy the, the early parts of the book, where you were talking about your, your childhood and, and the family, because you come from this very big, sort of, um, Irish, working-class family. I come from a very, sort of, mad, extreme family. And there's lots of great things about that and lots of bad things, you know, because if you're one of six kids, you end up sort of fighting for attention, which I think was always my kind of story. You know, I was in the middle. So I was always trying to get attention and uh, hence, I think, becoming the person that I've become. Did they know before you told them that, that you were gay? Well, they told me, uh, you know, obviously once I'd come out, they said we always kind of knew you were a bit odd. But were your parents, I mean, were they ashamed of you? Or no, did not they... at all, no, not at all. My parents are brilliant. I mean, they, as I say, you know, now looking back, I mean, when I was a teenager, I thought they were really unreasonable. But now looking back, I think, my God, what they've put up with. I mean, because none of their parents are really equipped to deal with these things, you know, because I used to really try to rile them. I mean, I used to sit in the front room, so what, what makeup. What, sorry, what age was that? Oh, from like, when I was about 14, I used to kind of wear, you know, big platforms and always the loudest colours. My mum ever took me shopping, I always wanted the biggest, you know, sort of brightest yellow jumper and the highest platforms. So it started very early when I was about 11. I remember one day I was saying in the book that I went to Sunday school and I had this big cravat on and a big sort of floppy hat and a camel hair coat. And uh, my mum used to say, oh, let him get on with it, you know, if he gets beat up, that's his problem. And uh, it was quite funny, that's how they used to deal with it. And then, then you had this kind of wonderful period of, like, you were living in squats and and uh, doing a lot of dressing up and going to clubs and, and that comes across, I mean, was that like a really happy period for you? Actually, looking back at the book, that part 
is the part that really made me laugh because there was a you know a lot of freedom yeah no responsibilities you know we were basically living a very hedonistic lifestyle getting up at four in the afternoon living on sort of fish and chips and toast going to the blitz going to all these kind of really trendy clubs and having fun yeah you know, sleeping yeah. with loads of people and falling over drunk it was it was a great time uh, the, the one thing that I, I uh, that came out of the book for me was that you were like a, always a sort of famous person in waiting that you always kind of you know, like even before Culture Club, you were kind of notorious in the London clubs, and you always wanted to kind of stand out from the crowd. I mean, why? Why do you think that is? I think sort of growing up as a as a gay man, you tend to feel ostracised from society. You're told from a very early age that you don't fit in. I mean, even just with the kind of subtle things like the humour, and you know, you're made to, made aware that what you're feeling isn't normal. So I think that kind of makes you sort of put two fingers up to society and I think a lot of what I've done in my life has been because I felt as an outsider and so what I did was I made myself into an absolute outsider you know because I kind of took the attitude well if you don't want me to belong then I'm definitely not going to and that was really what I did when I was a teenager and I'm kind of somewhere in the middle now half of me kind of realizes that I do want to belong and the other half of me still has two fingers up so it's a kind of fine balance yeah so when when Culture Club did hit it really bit and you, you were absolutely massive I mean for like two or three years you were probably one of the most famous people <laughs> on the planet I mean you were I mean how, how did you deal with that I mean what was it anything like you expected <clears throat> I think I dealt with it by being as kind of dramatic and uncontrollable as I mean at the time I thought I was really kind of balanced you know but obviously <laughs> I wasn't and um, having you know as I say reading the book and writing the book it really kind of revealed a lot of that stuff to me about what a monster I did become yeah I think you know, anybody who comes from a kind of working class family and gets really successful and has loads of money does kind of leave the floor for a while. You kind of hover in space and you, unfortunately, you know, when you're successful, everybody fawns around you and treats you like a kind of demigod and you just lose it. You know, and I lost it for about six years. <laughs> you were quite coy um, about your sexuality in, in the culture club. You, well, people that. always say this to me, but, I mean, look at the way I was dressed. How coy was that? I mean, you know, sometimes you don't need to be political with words. I mean, you know, my image was very gay. I mean, you know, if anyone thought I was straight, that's their problem. But then you did make the, <laughs> you did make the famous uh, cup of tea <clears throat> remark, which, which was you at your coyest, really, wasn't it? You, you know, that comment was so throwaway. I was on the Russell Hartley show. I mean, Russell was a big queen as well, you know. And he Never. was kind of prying into my sort of sexuality, and I just said I'd rather have a cup of tea. I mean, it's been given such political weight, that comment, over the years. Um, and really it was just like a gag that you just made? It was just a throwaway comment, yeah. you know. I mean, as I say, at the time I'd, I had no desire to kind of announce what I was doing to people, to let them know what was going on in my private life. It was none of their business. So throughout the whole Culture Club period, you were having this incredibly tempestuous relationship with, with the drummer from Culture Club, John Moss. Now, he actually claims he's straight, doesn't he? I don't think it matters. I mean... I read an interview with John a couple of months ago in a, in a magazine and uh, the interviewer kind of didn't really get into the sexuality thing but the headline was, I loved boy George but I think he only fancied me and the idea was that, you know, I wanted the sex but he wanted the love and I think that that's the way kind of people like John get around it, you know, it wasn't a sexual thing for them, it was a love thing. But, um, you know, the whole, is he straight, is he gay, I don't care, it doesn't matter. People are sexual and, um, you know, strange things happen. I wanted to ask you uh, about your love life. Um, why are you offering? Uh, well, I... <laughs> no, I've been in a relationship for uh, nine years now with a boy called Michael. Yeah. An Irish boy with big lips and beautiful eyes. Yeah. And uh, we're still happily married at the moment. You've got a new single coming out, haven't you? I've got a new single coming out called Same Thing in Reverse, which is the kind of sort of, you know, gay pop anthem, but it's saying, basically, that there's no difference. It's the same thing in reverse. Nothing better, nothing worse. I mean, there are some gay people who think that our lifestyle is superior, and it's not. It's no different. It's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same set of feelings. Can I just ask you, I mean, talking about records, are there any songs that you've written that you, you just hate to hear? Songs like Karma Chameleon kind of do get on my nerves a bit, because, really? like, you know, wherever I go, people kind of start singing it. You know, you'll be, <laughs> oh, like, no. in Spain, and you'll get... Yeah, you go to like, a disco Karma. in Spain, yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, I've been in clubs where they put that on, and it's cleared the dance floor. It's very successful at clearing the dance floor. I just remember when I wrote... Karma Chameleon, I took it to the rest of the college club, they just like totally took the mickey out of me and they were like banging pots and going, yeah! And Roy actually said to me, this is going to ruin our credibility. And I think he's probably right. <laughs> and just finally, I just wanted to ask you about um, your image. I mean, you're, you're still constantly changing your look and everything. And Do you think there'll ever come a time, though, when you won't bother with putting on the makeup <coughs> and, say, when you're 65, will you still be...? 
Well, please God, if I'm still here, I hope to be as camp as possible. Really? You know, my sort of heroes are people like Quentin Crisp, Cecil Beaton. I think it's, uh, you know, because, I mean, it's more interesting to look a bit camp, I think. Yeah. I hope, hopefully I'll have, like, a kind of blue rinse or something. Or, <laughs> you know, some velvet jackets, you know, some flip-flops. I don't know. We'll see what happens, see what's fashionable at the time, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, George, thank you very much for coming <laughs> on the welcome. show. It's lovely, lovely meeting you. And you're going to stay because you've got a few All right. bits and bobs coming up and stuff. But uh, it's been lovely. And uh, Rona. Thanks, Bert. Well, it may be crowded at the bottom, but uh, it's just as lonely at the top. If you're a gay professional looking for love, there's a new club which caters for singles. We spent an evening with Out and Out. Jules Barb and Chino leads an unusual double life. For most of the time, she's an opera singer, but she doubles up as London's top gay society hostess for the exclusive Gentleman's Introduction Agency and Dining Club, Out and Out. I started Out and Out because I had so many gay friends, gorgeous gay friends, who just weren't meeting people um, on the scene. They, they didn't perhaps hate the scene, but they, they weren't meeting the right sort of people, or it was just superficial relationships, and they wanted more. So I had a dinner party, I invited them all along, and they all knew me, didn't know each other, and we had a fantastic time, and it really sort of blossomed from there. Now Jules has over 150 eligible and well-heeled gay men in her dining club. Lovely. Membership is £100 a year, plus the cost of each dinner. It's more relaxing this way, isn't it? Yes. Every potential member is interviewed personally. So, for a partner, do you have an idea of the sort of man you'd like to be meeting? Would you like them to be professional types, business oh, definitely types? definitely professional, yes. Right. I have to be honest, it's very hard to tell if somebody's unsuitable in the initial interview. Sometimes they'll come along to their first dinner and that's when they start to misbehave. There was one chap who came along one evening who spent the whole evening talking about his sexual exploits, which upset some people, so he was asked not to come back. Olivia. The dinner parties are very much tailor-made, will invite people who have similar ages, similar interests. So you might find an opera singer ne sitting next to a labourer, but they might both have a passion for ancient, I don't know, <laughs> ancient Greece or something. I think they might get on. Jules organises three dinners a month and plans everything in meticulous detail. Placements, flowers and hand-painted name cards. Mike is an information tech manager in a city bank and lives in Bromley, Kent. He's on the way to his fourth Out and Out dinner. I first heard about uh, Out and Out through an advert in Gay Times. I phoned the number that's on the, on the ad and spoke to a charming woman, or Jules, um, had a good hour's outrageous conversation with her, got on so well with her. Um, it seemed that she ran the company in a very professional way, which is something I like. It's certainly not an upper market cruising club. Yes, people do have to make the commitment of a hundred pounds membership. It's not a huge amount of money. It's certainly not in a league of what some of the dating agencies are, are charging. Russell lives in South Kensington, London. Tonight will be his first out and out dinner. I would like to meet the someone, whether it's blonde, brunette, city banker, whatever I hope he's there if you're talking to generally professional gay men like myself um, the question they often ask is where do I meet similar gay professional men to myself um, it is difficult on the scene because the scene is full of silly queens disco bunnies guys who hold their cigarettes vertically and wave them around pretentiously well, Jules carefully selects the mix of people. At tonight's dinner are two investment bankers, a catering manager, a corporate marketing executive, a travel agent, a training consultant and two designers. If you're on the dole, I'm sorry to say you can't afford to, to go to these sorts of events. Um, but, you know, that's, that's life, I'm afraid. Sorry, but that, that's reality. One of the strengths of Out and Out is that you're getting to meet people on the same social level, social in the sense that they've got the same interests and enthusiasms for things like the theatre, art and literature. Who's coming? Come on, let's go. Mamma ragazza. We've got uh, tricolore salad, um, brie al delicato, which is a deep fried brie, um, and the summer extravaganza, which is an amazing sort of, it's a sort of a, a starter fruit salad thing, which is rather lovely they do here. And then um, we've got 
lovely chicken dish in Barolo wine sauce, which is yummy. Um, lemon sole fillet stuffed with mushrooms in a white wine sauce and Crespolina Fiorentina for the uh, vegetarians. Focaccia. I did before, I met him, and it's something you know, that I do. Yes. I do everything I do. He does, what does he do? He's retired. He's got an income. He has an income. Oh, I always sit at a different table. I sit apart from them because when it comes down to it, they might like me, but they haven't come here to meet me. So uh, I give them their space. They know I'm here. And I look after them, but it's a uh, discreet distance. I worked in the city for three years before I actually went to see a play. I mean, it's I think it's a cracking evening actually. They seem to be getting on fantastically. I thought they would. They're a lively, a lively lot. There's certainly, I think there'll be a lot of phone numbers swapping at the end of the evening. You just watch yourself, otherwise those teeth will be in a glass by the end of the evening. They will be anyway. Yes, embedded. Russell's done fantastically. I think he was quite nervous to start with, but he seems to be having a fantastic time. He was totally holding court earlier. <laughs> So, was there anyone at the dinner that caught Michael Russell's eye? I didn't feel it was appropriate to give anybody else my number. Not this evening. Yes. Go on then, Russell. Tell us who. No. Absolutely not. Well, I uh, didn't fancy much of them. Did you, have you ever dated professionals, George? No, but I hope they will choke on their deep-fried <laughs> brie. I mean, what a bunch of snobs. I mean, they're just those kind of professional homosexuals that I despise. What sort of uh, men do you like to date? Nice ones with personalities who don't care about <laughs> being on the dole. Well, still to come, Eve Gallagher sings in the studio. We bring you another Gay Time TV camp countdown. And Amy LaMay finds out just what happens on a gay murder mystery holiday. But first, you might think that the last time England won the World Cup for football was 1966. But you'd be wrong, because we won it this year. That's right. The Stonewall Football Club beat the previously invincible San Francisco Spikes in the final of the Gay World Cup in Berlin last month and have returned the proud owners of the World Cup. Let's take a look at the boys in action. London Stonewall. London Stonewall. London Stonewall. London Stonewall. London Stonewall. Well, here they are. Here, come in, boys. So, well, you've had a great victory in Berlin. To tell us about it. Yeah, well, it was the 11th Gay World Cup, and uh, we beat San Francisco 1-0 in the final. And they're like the Brazil of gay football. I mean, they've won it seven times wow. previously, so I guess we're over the moon, Rona. And who, uh, <laughs> who scored the winning goal? Our hero, Mr Tony Woodward here. Tony! 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 Tony. <laughs> <laughs> you are the, you're the first team to actually bring home a cup for England since 1966. So what, what's the secret of your success? Well, I think it must be the team songs, must not it? <laughs> <laughs> now we have a sing song and I think it's the spirit me, uh, more than anything else. Um, you know, great camaraderie and I think we were really psyched up and I think uh, we probably wanted it this year more than any other team. You wanted it bad. Yeah, we wanted it bad. <laughs> <laughs> you play against a lot of straight teams. How, how did they react to you? When you beat them 7-0, what can they say? I mean, mm. <laughs> there's, there's no homophobia from them at all? No, I think now that we've actually been playing in that particular league, um, we're respected as, as a team that, I mean, naturally when we first came out and they thought that it was going to be a load of us playing football, they thought, oh yeah, great, we're going to stuff them. But um, I think once that they realised... I beg your pardon? Oh, well, I'll <laughs> rephrase that, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but no, they, they, they're, they're really good about it. And um, as I say, I mean, they, they even, I think they're very jealous of the fact that we actually get the chance to play an international competition and, uh, and they don't, so... Did you take it really seriously? <laughs> Yeah, I'm very much so. I mean, we train twice a week and um, in fact a lot of us actually play for a straight team on Saturdays and play for the gay team on Sundays. So as long as we remember what day it is, we're all right. We're going to ask you now to sing this uh, famous song for us now. Ooh. So uh, You're going to join in? Yeah, well, I might, I might tap a bit like this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, my heart will be in it. So um, can, we, can we hear it then? You ready boys? One, two, three. Together, we're the boys on tour. Together, hear the lions roar. Together, in the Berlin sun. Together, we're so glad we've come. Go east, off to Germany. Go east, but it's a place to be. Go east, score when we're put through. Go east, this is what we're gonna do. Go east! Thank you very much, boys, and then yeah. good luck in future games. If you'd like to join the lads, then you can write to Stonewall FC, care of Gay Time TV. 
PO Box 7300, London E14 9SA. Well, we all know that you've been following our resident fitness expert, Mark Anthony, with great enthusiasm, but now it's time for our last instalment, and this week we move on to our stomachs. Yes, yeah, so get down for the last time with Mark Anthony and his superb Body Beautiful. <laughs> Hi, this is Mark Anthony coming to you with the last exercise of this program. Today we're going to work on stomach, but before that, remember to do your stretching exercises. And we're going to do the front of your stomach and those trim those love handles. So, Natalie, if you can help me. Thank you. Okay, feet together. That's about the right position the sit-up and head up hands behind or to chest and down and breathe out breathe in and then with a twist you come into the twist breathe in and then twist again breathe out breathe in and breathe out okay thank you if you'd like to Pair off. We'll demonstrate it once again. Okay, down we go. Together. Lovely breathing. And back up. Slowly. Breathe out. Breathe in. Right, we're going to go into a twist. Left to right. Great. And again, down. And right to left. Okay, that was your workout for your stomach and your love handles. Beginners would start with three sets of five to maybe ten as you build up. Be careful if you feel any uncomfortable injury, consult your doctor immediately. So, hope you've enjoyed watching. Keep up the good work and have fun. Be safe. Cheerio and thank you very much. Bye bye. Cheerio. Cheerio, Mark. <laughs> so listen, George, uh, do you have any health and fitness tips you'd like to give us? I don't bother with any fitness. I just eat men like that. <laughs> oh, uh, hey. <laughs> now it's time, though, for our weekly camp countdown. This week we've searched the TV vaults to bring you our top five henpecked husbands. At five, Sid takes horrendous hitting from Hattie. <laughs> At number four, Jerry faces the music. Jerry? What have you been saying about the sound of music? <laughs> At three, Sybil vents her spleen. And Lazzle! <laughs> the fantastic Arthur takes a panning at two. Don't stay away from Paul and Peter! Stay away from the And straight in at number one, Johnny Jitters at Fanny Fury. No, Johnny, not at the Alba Ball. I just love Fanny Craddock. Does that, does that remind you of your stormy relationships there? Did no, you ever, I would never did you, do anything like that. She's a rattled. Do you have favourite objects that you picked up and would throw at people? Um, like once I threw a sort of very large Coca-Cola bottle at John and hit him on the head with it and he uh, yeah, had to go to the hospital. I thought I'd killed him actually. Oh no. But he lived. Well, you might have done it with some lead piping in the lounge with Colonel Mustard, I know I have, but uh, now you can do it for real on a gay murder mystery weekend. Gay Time TV's very own Amy Lamay went down to Darkest Hampshire to investigate. Gay Time TV have invited me to the glamorous and terribly English New Forest in Hampshire for something called a gay murder mystery holiday. Apparently, the Baroness von Munchen has died in mysterious circumstances, and I have to find out who killed her. I'm Lady Marion Bart, the late Baroness's personal companion. I'm to be very posh and look down on anyone who doesn't have a jet set style life. Do they know me already? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? I'd just like to welcome you all to the Rhinefield um, House Hotel for this uh, weekend of murder, mystery and mayhem. We have some costumes here and we have some guest parts to hand out. So first off, I'm looking for the Cardinal. 
Uh, yes, you look like the Harvard Silver. Would you like to? <laughs> when they arrive, all the guests are allocated the part they're going to play for the weekend. We need a sort of Gaudi librarian type, you know, sort of Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> this being a gay and lesbian murder mystery weekend, there's a fair amount of cross-dressing. You get a fair number of people who love detective novels. You get a fair number of people who love dressing up and pretending to be somebody else. And you get a fair number of people who just want a different kind of weekend away. <laughs> Fantastic. It's very you. Very Morgan Plum Country Pursuits have been organizing gay murder mystery weekends since October 94. They cater primarily for groups of 20 or so friends, but they do have some weekends specifically for singles or couples. This group's a mixture of lesbian and gay British rail employees and customers of the Gloucester Pub in Greenwich, London. So do you think it's going to be a gay man or a lesbian that solves the murder? Um, definitely a lesbian. Why is that? Well, they're far more intelligent. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Excuse me, sir. There are several plots for the murder mystery holidays. This one involves the murder of a 1920 socialite, Baroness von Munchen. Everyone is both detective and suspect, and you have the duration of the weekend to work out who done it. First, you're given secret instructions which your character has to act on, and this is when you find out whether or not you're the murderer. <laughs> Someone in this room has just found out that they're a murderer. Most of the first day is spent swapping clues, bartering information, and spying on your fellow guests. There are three actors to move the plot along. But with the Baroness's chauffeur murdered before he could reveal the vital clue, the murderer's identity still escaped me. Are you the murderer? Oh, certainly not. You've got the face of a murderer. I think it's you. Well, isn't that the most? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Girls, do you fancy coming upstairs and having a look at my alibis? Come on, then. This is my boudoir. You certainly do get murdered in style around here. You're right, girls. Yeah. So what attracted you to coming on a murder mystery holiday weekend then? Well, I read a lot of Agatha Christie's, you see. Do you? I and I wanted to, to be in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you come here and this whole setting is like really realistic. It's, yeah. It's like you're in it, you know. Completely. Poirot's got to wander in in a minute. <laughs> If you want to take a break from the intrigue and poison, you can always take a stroll around the grounds and pretend you really are Lady Muck. The murder mystery weekends take place in various country house hotels around Britain. They cost around £130 per person. That includes the room and all your meals. But champagne is extra. <laughs> No murder mystery would be complete without a solution. So, at the end of the holiday, we all meet in the Grand Hall to swap accusations and to find out who killed the Baroness. Right, ladies and gentlemen and the servants, you've all had a chance to think about who done it and why, so uh, now's a chance for you to tell all. I know, for a fact, that the Cardinal did it. I think it was the maid. <gasps> it was the librarian. <gasps> in every murder, you look for three things means, motive, and opportunity. So, there's only one person. Who is the uh, boyfriend of Linda Lovely? Who has appeared in all these lists? And that is Mr. L.J. Barrett. So the murderer is unmasked. At the end of the weekend, there are prizes for the best thespian lesbian, best drama queen, best detective, and most convincing character. Okay, so I didn't guess who did it. But hey, I had a lot more fun than Miss Marple ever did. Well, I think that's, uh, that looks like great fun. Did you, did you fancy one of those weekends away? It's probably the sort of thing I wouldn't do, but if I did, I'd probably enjoy it. I love that Amy LeMay. She's yeah. campus Christmas, isn't she? I like her. Sweet. It looks we'll like a weekend with her. It looks like a good laugh, really, doesn't it? Yeah, it does look quite funny. Well, boy, George, thank you very much for coming on the last show. It's been an absolute pleasure, and good luck with everything. Yeah, thanks very much, George. Enjoy yourself. Well, we've nearly come to the end of the show and the end of the series, but uh, it's been great, and thank you for all your letters. Absolutely, and we'll see you again soon. But now it's time to close the show with the final Torch song, singing a song co-written by Boy George entitled Last Night. It's Eve Gallagher.
Sometimes I wake up and tell myself This loving business ain't good for my health So I light up a cigarette Through a smoke screen I reflect On how love has done me wrong Done me wrong From a devil's point of view I really got my hooks in you And if I forget that you need loving too I'm sorry baby Everyone knows Your place is with me We ain't writing no books darling Making no history Last night I stopped loving you but only for a minute Last night I stopped loving you But I knew I would regret it And I'd never let it change my point of view Above may shake his head Or was that something strange I read So I light up a cigarette And through a smoke screen I reflect On how life has done me wrong Done me wrong And from a demon's point of view I really got my hooks in you And if I forget that you have feelings too I'm sorry baby Everyone knows Your place is with me We ain't writing no books darling Making no history Last night I stopped loving you but only for a minute Last night I stopped loving you But I knew I would regret it And I'd never let it change my point of view